Alexis Goldsmith, and I will moderate this press conference today. And um, I'm currently in North Central Troy, New York, and I would like to open with a brief land acknowledgement. It is with gratitude and humility that I acknowledge that the land upon which I sit, upon which the city of Troy and the city of Cohoes sits, including the Norlite facility, resides upon the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous peoples of the land of New York. Despite tremendous hardships and being forced from their lands, today their community resides in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. I pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as I commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Okay, and now I will open up the press conference by passing it over to Joe Ritchie, who is the Executive Director of Saratoga Sites Against Norlite Emissions. Joe? Thank you, Alexis. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Joe Ritchie. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Norlite, of Saratoga Sites Against Norlite Emissions, and I'm also a full-time student at Syracuse University and also a longtime resident of Saratoga Sites in Cohoes, New York. Um, Again, thank you for everyone for coming out today. It really means a lot. Um, the news was very unsettling, um, what we've been learning in the past few months. Um, you know, it's really hard um, living next to this facility that I've lived next to for so long. I've, I've noticed things from horrible smells to dust in our windowsills to people just getting sick for no real, real reason. Um, Last, and then we're almost a year from the AFFF issue on Valentine's Day. That will be next month, actually in a few weeks. And that issue really catapulted me into this issue of, of Norlite and, and knowing what's, what's my, my horrible neighbor. Um, I've lived here for so long, but I've, I have zero answers as to what they do, as to what they've done. And, you know, we've learned so many things in the past year about this facility, about the entities that regulate it and about the wonderful community that we have here who are willing to, f to stand up to these horrible, horrible corporations. And one of the issues that we've been learning about is, is this really awful silica dust that can cause a wide range of horrible diseases. Um, and I'll let the experts speak more on that later, but it's just very unsettling that people daily are breathing in glass and they're being killed from the inside. There's no other way to say it. Um, all on making a dollar figure. It's an absolute shame. This should be the number one priority of all officials on this call right now and that are going to be listening to this um, because this has been an issue for decades. Yes, we've had COVID. Yes, that's important. But this issue has been Saratoga sites COVID for 50 years. It's been slowly knocking people off and it's, it will not happen anymore under our watch. And this is why we're bringing these issues to the force. You know, it's, it's, it's an absolute shame that I've had to send in samples to get tested. It, it just, it's an absolute shame that the DEC hasn't done this and they haven't they said, we really need for this facility to stop doing this. It's, it's a real shame that I have to do the job of a DEC on-site monitor that works there every single day. Again, it's a shame and I should never have to do that. But unfortunately, I, I did. And fortunately, I had great resources like my friend, Dr. Dave Walker. I'm very grateful for everything he's done and all his, uh, his work he's done. It's, it's, it's just fabulous. You know, in regards to DEC, they have I believe they were just appointed in the 2022 budget, $1.3 billion. That's about a 30% increase um, from last year. Where's that money going? I think it's going into people's pockets instead of to the communities that really need it. We really need to focus on communities around the state and especially in Cohoes, New York. The governor needs to step up and he needs to act. The DEC for far too long has been working with Norlight and putting things underneath, underneath the radar. And it's an absolute shame. You know, we've had to deal with a fire just as recently as MLK Day. It's something that we should have never had to have, have done. The residents should have evacuated. They should have been put in a shelter in place. Something had to have done. Instead, nothing was done in regards to the residents' health. It, it's again, I keep saying it, but it's, 
it's a real shame that this has to happen in this time. It is really a bad, bad thing. So I'm please calling on the, the governor to act, all the local representatives that are on here to act, because we really need this facility to learn its lesson. And we really need the leaders to step up instead of the community begging people to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And we're gonna go to Dr. Dave Walker next, but first I have a short video um, to set the stage and I will share that now. On December 16th and 17th, 2020, Cohoes and surrounding areas got hit with more than 20 inches of snow. I took the opportunity to record video footage at Norlight and Saratoga sites. I recorded this first group of shots within 24 hours after the snow stopped falling on the 17th. As you can see, at Saratoga sites, the snow is bright white, pristine in many locations and played in or walked in in others. This is a view of the mound underneath a lightweight aggregate conveyor in Norlight's finishing area on the same day and time as the previous footage. Dust is already migrating across the snow. According to Norlight's standard plan of operation, lightweight aggregate like this went through a rotary kiln and was conveyed to the pile. The kiln is fueled primarily with hazardous waste and comes out of the clinker along with bottom ash which often contains heavy metals and other hazardous contents. The material safety data sheet for the lightweight aggregate states that this material can cause silicosis, which is potentially fatal. This next section was recorded three days after the snow stopped falling. I did not record the snow at Saratoga sites that day. Six days after the snowfall, I returned to the same location to record the changes in the snow. As you can see at Saratoga sites, there is a consistent layer of brownish sediment that has settled fairly uniformly on the surface. Please note the areas where I recorded are not next to roadways and the central courtyard is shielded on four sides with intermittent breaks. On this same visit, I also utilized a drone to record a view of the Norlight grounds. Dust has spread in multiple directions, both from human activity and natural phenomena like wind. This spread of silicate dust is hazardous to the community. Okay, and so that sets the stage for the results. And to explain more about the silica dust, I'd invite Dr. Dave Walker, who is a, a PhD geologist retired from Columbia University to share his screen, please. Hi, good afternoon. I first became interested in this problem uh, from the chemical contaminants in the combustion products and could possibly emitted from the sky from Norway. But I only really became interested in this when Joe Ritchie posted this photo, supposedly the soot coming from the sky. 
But as a geologist, one look at this told me this isn't smack emission uh, from a combustion. This looks very much like. Hey, Dave, it's really hard to hear you. Can you come closer to the mic? The uh, combustion products hypothesis didn't look like what we were seeing on the ground. And it looked very much from my geological training as if we were dealing with volcanic ash, which is glass thick. So I asked Joe to send me some. And sure enough, when one looks at this material microscopically, you see a transmitted light. So light is coming through very thin fragments, particle one, particle two on the right, and transmitted light. And you can see that it's rich in bubbles. I'm sorry, Dave, it's still really difficult to hear you. I think it's a setting with your microphone. Um, Steve, it sounds like Dave's mic is being compressed or something. Well, he might have limited bandwidth from where he is. I think we might want to try having you share the uh, video and have Dave just be on mic. Sure. Dave, do you mind if we switch to that? Not at all. Uh, you, I'll stop the sharing. Okay. Give me just one moment to pull up the slides. I only have it on PDF. Is that OK? Yeah, yes, that will be fine. And maybe turn off your video too, Dave, if you have it on at home. OK, start from the beginning, Dave, please. Okay. The original thinking on the Norlite facility was that the danger lay in the combustion products, which might be laced with incompletely, deter incompletely destroyed hazardous material. But my view of this changed rather dramatically after Joe posted this photo uh, on 17th of November. And my geological experience suggested simply looking at this, that we're not dealing with a combustion product. We're looking at volcanic glass, which has uh, a fair amount of gla uh, glass shards in it. If I could have the next slide, please. I took a microscopic look at the material that Joe sent me. Next slide, please. Yeah, there it is. Thank you. And what I saw was, in fact, yes, this stuff is loaded with bubbly, sharp edge glass shards. In fact, this is most of the material which was collecting on his windshield. Particle one has a couple of prominent bubbles and a few small ones. Particle two is somewhat different, and it has a mineral fragment embedded with it. And that can be clearly seen when we go from transmitted light mode cross polar mode in which everything which is not mineral just simply disappears. So particle one, which is this bubbles in glass, completely disappears. And the wrapper on the quartz grain in particle two disappears, but the quartz grain remains because that interacts with the polar of the microscope and remains visible. So we're dealing with a Material that's very much like volcanic glass. It's full of bubbles. It's full of glass shards. It has some mineral fragments embedded in it. And the question is, what volcano would possibly deliver this material to Saratoga sites? Well, of course, there aren't any local volcanoes. So we had to look into the Norlite aggregate, which you can see in the same mode of presentation on the next slide, which is, uh, next slide, please, Alex. Thank you. Yeah. You see, once again, the bubbly glass matrix, two different photos of the same thing. The thinner flakes of the glass are quite transparent. The thicker flakes are this dark, dark stained brown. And there's really no question that we're dealing with exactly the same material. So the volcano that we're looking for is nothing other than the Norlite aggregate kiln, which makes this stuff by taking shale and heat treating it to the point where it starts to bubble and froth and turn to glass. Next slide, please. Can you talk a little slower, Dave, please? Sorry? Can you talk a little slower, please? Yes. Uh, next slide, please. The material doesn't simply lodge on Joe's windshield at Saratoga sites. If you cross Route 32 and look at Ed Sokol's attic, the same material is 90% of the dust that's accumulated in his attic over the years. It's this bubbly glass shardy material with occasional mineral fragments and embedded stuff. His attic has a squirrel problem. There's some squirrel fur in there and a little bit of rust, but 90% of what is sometimes in his attic is in fact this volcanic 
fragmented glass aggregate that comes right out of the Norlite pile. Next slide, please. Dave, did you hear me ask to talk a little bit slower? Sorry. Uh, next slide, please. Instead of transmitted light mode, this is an SEM backscattered image which concentrates on the surface morphology of the fragments, this time in edge-attic. And you can see that on the shards of glass matrix material, which have bubbles visible clearly in them, there are a lot of sharp edges and painting uh, protrusions which are certainly lacerating if they uh, uh, come in contact with you or you guys are in the other place. Another characteristic of the particles from edge attic is that there's quite a dispersion of fine particles as well as the big ones that you can see here. You can see all the dust in the background, which is small. Some of it goes down to less than a micron, five microns, 10 microns, lots of that stuff, as well as the big particles. So this is clearly sharp edge stuff, and there's lots of it, with these uh, fugitive dust emissions coming from our light. Next slide, please. Here we have, again, a transmitted light photomicrograph. And the difference between the right panel and the left panel of these two is that the right panel is cross polar And if material is optically active, as is quartz, as glass is not, you will see it bright. So in the upper pair of frames of the same image of a grain of quartz, which comes out of uh, Joe's windshield, you see a spectrum of colors from gray on the edges to sort of purple in the middle. Those interference fringes are a direct track of the thickness of the material to which the light is advancing. And the purple stuff is the thickest, and the stuff out on the perimeter of this is thinnest. The thickness from thick to purple to thin to uh, uh, gray on the edge is a measure of the sharpness. So the stuff on the feather edge in white and gray is an exquisitely sharp surface. On the other hand, where the star is, the purple just falls off a cliff into the background order of the American country. And so you can think of this as a micro hand axe, which is a grip with the star, and everything else will be surgical instrument for laceration of whatever it comes in contact with. The lower frame, again, polarized and un, un, uh, cross polars and not cross polars. The star is the blunt edge of a little tiny surgical light, and the rest of the gray fringe is the sharp edge of this. This is not road quartz from somewhere else. This is from the piles of aggregate, because you can see in the lower image, the upper corner has the ugly glass matrix material adhering to it. It's part of the story. Next slide, please. So my pitch is simple. It's very clear that the dust is from Norlite. I'm confirming what's already on the DEC website. I could have saved myself an hour in the uh, library by doing what well, I did. I, I didn't go and look on the website first. I looked at the glass and spent a week looking at this stuff. And all I did was confirm what's clearly visible on the DEC. Website. They know the glass is from Norlite. The dust is dangerous. You don't need to take my word from it. Uh, Professor Kasavi will tell you a little bit more about that later. But you only have to look at the Norlite manufacturer's uh, safety data sheet to understand that this stuff is very bad news. You don't want to go breathing this. The dust emissions have been going on for decades with complaints. And the remaining question is, why is this allowed to continue? When will the DC start remediating the situation? And I would now like to turn over the, uh, <clears throat> the podium to Professor Sasande. Good morning. Can you hear me fine? Great. So my comments will be brief. Um, I'm a Pediatrician. Oh, sorry. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm a pediatrician and direct uh, the NYU Center for the Investigation of Environmental Hazards. Uh, and so 
while I'm a pediatrician, I've, I have uh, substantial training in environmental medicine. And one of the earliest diagnoses uh, that one learns about as part of that training is silicosis, which is typically the, it, seen in workers who are chronically exposed to dust, like uh, Dr. Walker described in his presentation. Uh, what we're talking about here is particularly concerning because it's an uncontrolled community level exposure to the same kinds of contaminants. This is why um, occupational medicine experts and industrial hygienists take uh, into account controls of the air uh, that workers breathe in this environment using respirators and such to limit the effects of these exposures. So we're talking about a completely different situation that actually in some ways magnifies the, the consequences in this vulnerable population uh, because this population can't uh, just move out uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, in addition, we have children living in these communities. Now, as a pediatrician, I'll double down and emphasize that children breathe in more air per pound of body weight and thereby have greater exposure uh, to uh, these chemical contaminants that literally can chronically scar the lungs. Uh, having consequences. So it's fair to say that I have serious concerns uh, about the consequences of the ongoing exposures uh, described by Dr. Walker and others uh, in the course of, of this presentation. And that um, uh, will be the end of my comments for now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chisandi. Um, and next, I would invite Chris Savinsky, who is a local Maplewood resident. Hi, everyone. Um, th thank you to Joe, uh, Dr. Chisandi, and Dr. Walker for, for great um, presentations. Um, I live 4,000 feet from Norlite smokestacks, uh, raising a family of four, four children uh, with my wife, Stacy, here in Maplewood, just over the border of uh, uh, Cohoes in the town of Colony. We moved in 14 years ago and immediately uh, noticed the, the, the Norlite um, uh, operation and began to you know, ask questions uh, about its, its operations and its safety. And uh, lo and behold, we, we were um, shocked to see a long history of blatant and flagrant violations of you know, public health and, and safety and, and environmental law. Um, time and time again, uh, Norlite you know, uh, committed these violations and, and uh, was, was slapped with, with small fines and, uh, and proceeded with, uh, with relatively little change to their practices. Uh, back earlier in the year, I think Joe mentioned the, the, the year um, uh, will be uh, up on uh, um, Valentine's Day. We, we learned about uh, Norlite uh, attempting to incinerate. I say attempting because they probably didn't completely incinerate. Uh, two and a half million pounds of AFFF um, aqueous film uh, film forming uh, firefighting foam um, uh, containing PFAS, which uh, a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, that that really um, uh, instigated a, a, a big reaction from uh, the the local concerned scientists and citizens. Um, I'm also a biochemist, uh, training in, in cancer biology, and so so this. Uh, link between PFAS and exposure to the neighbors, uh, including myself and my children, was, was a, a particular concern. Um, but this, um, in addition to, you know, their, their violations of the Clean Air Act and incomplete combustion of all of these hazardous wastes um, is, is, a, is, a, is a major um, escalation of the kind of risk and, and uh, danger that's posed by this operation. So I thank Dave Walker for verifying um, you know what, what was in that dust and Joe for collecting those samples and, and our friend Ed Sokol for, for allowing access to his, his attic. Uh, it's clear you know from, Ed's, uh, from from Dave's presentation that this material is emanating from Norlite's operations. Um, and it's clear that this, this material uh, you know can cause silicosis, pulmonary fibrosis and death. Um, it's clear that this needs to stop. Uh, so I'm here really to say three things. Uh, first, Norlite should cover those aggregate piles, just like, uh, you know, in, in big igloos, just like, uh, you know, the, the state and local governments need to cover their salt piles. Um, this is this is just not even a, this is a no brainer. 
uh, I, there have been multiple um, excursions just over this past winter on a daily basis. Anytime a wind, wind kicks up, those aggregate piles are 100 feet high and uh, 100, you know, hundreds of feet wide, and they're 150 feet away from Joseph Ritchie's house. Now, that's just not fair. Um, cover those piles. We, this is not a, you know, this is not a request. This is a demand. Um, Trade to be, uh, who owns Norlite, is a profitable multinational company. They can afford to do this. Cover the piles. Cover the conveyor belts. Cover the operations that are, you know, causing the, the dust to leave Norlite, the glass, broken glass, to leave Norlite, and to enter all of our, you know, fine neighbors' lungs. Cover those piles. Number two, DEC has had an on-site monitor there for, I don't know, 15 years, potentially more. They should have known about this, and they do know about this. Um, you know, I, I'm calling on DEC today to really acknowledge, you know, the, this troubling history. Um, they have a, a rap sheet up on their, their webpage on the, the history of violations at Norlite that, that any and all of you can see. We'll post it to this chat. Um, and uh, many of uh, the complaints are associated with, with the dust um, that, that is persistently and consistently um, you know, been swept off of Norlite's piles and off of their, their conveyor belts by the wind and uh, onto people's homes, playgrounds, and into their lungs. So DEC, we're calling on you. You, you know what's going on now. You need to act. Uh, third, uh, this is clearly a public nuisance. Um, we need uh, the, the, uh, the Attorney General's Office, um, Environmental Protection Bureau, uh, to file a public nuisance lawsuit against Norlite and to get a court order to require that these, cover, these piles be covered, um, similar to these salt igloos that you see um, around the Department of Transportation and, and other places, um, and, and to stop operations at Norlite until this can, this can be done. Um, we, 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 we demand these three things, you know, cover those piles, DEC, acknowledge the issue and get to work on this faster than you have already. And the attorney general's office to file a lawsuit to make sure that this happens. Uh, so thanks again to uh, the previous speakers and to everybody here for, uh, for your attention. And that's all I have to say today. Thank you, Chris. And I believe we're also joined by Ed Sokol, um, who is a resident across the street from Saratoga Sites. Do we have Ed on the call? I don't know. Maybe he's not here. Ed, if you'd like to speak, go ahead. Oh, yeah. You're Do you hear, you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Um, well, I don't have the pedigree uh, the speakers had ahead of me, but I'm just uh, an old resident that lived on Etzel Place all his life. I'll just give you a little history of Norlite. I lived here, like I said, all my life and approximately 50 in the 50s, late 60s, Norlite started their business and we had no problems. We had no concerns. Every once in a while, we hear a, a dynamite blast and uh, it would shake us up a little bit, but there was no problems. And then about 10 years down the line, we had big problems. They only had one entrance and that entrance was at the north end of their plant. They had trucks filled up right up to the brink. They had so high that you could see the dust, you could see the aggregate on the top of them. They had tailgates that were bad, that leaked aggregate on the streets. When they got down on Saratoga Road, the wind, the gust of wind used to pick up the debris from the trucks and blow it all over. They would, the, the cars on the road would stir up the aggregate that was lost from the trucks. We were getting, we were getting the fugitive dust from the conveyors and also getting the dust from the piles of dirt. It was awful. 
we complained for years and years and years. And finally they got fed up and they says, we're gonna put another entrance and exit on the north part of their plant, which they did. And that leads to Elm Street. Elm Street only has a couple houses on there and it has several buildings. So they figured they would get less complaints doing it that way. And then one time, I'll tell you a story. One time down, down the line, I got a call from DEC and they asked me if they could have permission to put a test canister on my lawn. And I said, absolutely. And they said, they showed me the canister and they said, now that white plate you see on the bottom, when you see that black, you give us a call. Now that'll probably take about a month or so to happen. But when that happens, give us a call. Every night when I came home from work, I would go out there and check that canister. At the end of the week, I checked that canister. After the first week, it was black. I'm saying to myself, how black is black? I picked up the phone, called him and told him, look, look it. I know you said it would take a month or, or over to turn this black, but it's black. They said, I'll come over and check it. They did. And looking at the man's expression when he picked it up, I think he was amazed that it was that black in that short of a time. Well, he picked it up, put it in a bag, took it away. I never saw him again. Never heard of it again. Didn't get any results at a test. And then down the line, they started burning hazardous waste. My niece that lives across the street, she was very concerned because she's got a couple of kids, a couple of young children. So she formed a group. We had over 200 petitioners. She invited DEC, Norlite, one of the congressmen, the mayor from up in Cohoes at that time was Mayor McDonald. We all met at the seniors quarters up in Cohoes. Everybody expressed their concern. We were promised everything. We were promised they're going to control the dust on the conveyors. They were, we were promised they're gonna control the dust from the piles. We were promised they're gonna put new scrubbers in so we wouldn't smell the fumes coming out of the smokestacks. Needless, needless to say, 30 years later, we still, still have the same problems. We're still talking about dust particles. We're still talking about smells coming from the fumes. Now, how can you trust DEC and Norlite? DEC will tell you the predominantly winds come from south to north. There's a railroad track that runs between Norlite and the Saratoga sites. This railroad track borders both sites and it runs south to north. DEC will tell you the prevailing winds come from the south. And they say they have monitors mon monitoring the air quality for toxic air and for PM. And they do have these monitors. They have one on Shaker Road in Albany. They have one at Pearl Street in Albany. And they have one at South Albany. All these sites are down the wrong way the wind direction comes. 
They did have one site in Troy. Ed, if you could wrap it up quickly, thank you. Okay, they had one site in Troy, which did show that it had toxic material in it, but they closed that down. That site was opened up in 1983 when we complained, and then they closed it down in 2010. This place, this Norlight place has to be shut down. There's too many people with sickness around here. My brother-in-law had, my brother-in-law had, uh, has uh, cancer of the blood. There's a person up the street from me has, her family has thyroid cancer. There's people over at, down below that I just heard is a woman that died of uh, respiratory problems. This place has to be shut down and it has to be shut down fast. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, and now if there are any reporters on the call who would like to ask a question of the panelists here, I'd invite them to, come, to unmute themselves and feel free to ask a question. Can you guys hear me? Yes, Dave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to add one more thing. So my name is Dave Pablo. I'm the person who put together that video uh, recording the changes in the snow. Um, I've also been working on a documentary about Norlite over the last past several months, which I will be releasing on Monday. And it includes a lot of uh, interviews with local residents and the common element in almost all of them is respiratory issues, uh, especially with the children who live, they don't even wanna let their kids outside, but of course it does happen. And uh, so this is a uh, consistent issue. Also for the members of the press who are on this call, I want to basically point you to this story that has been hiding in plain sight for a long, long time. Um, on the DEC's website, uh, there is a document that you can find just by doing a Google search, which lists off all the violations that DEC has enforced at Norlite over the last, you know, 30 some odd years. And the one, the very first one in 1990 was Fugitive Dust. And they revisited that in 1995, in 2002, in 2010. The measures that they took every single time did not address the core issue, nor really does it mention silica dust, uh, but it should because of course, another document that is again available on Norlight's website is that MSDS document, okay? So this has been going on forever and uh, it hasn't really been addressed. Um, so I, I, you know, there are other issues that I can go into. Oh, uh, one last issue. Uh, again, if you look at the documentation that's on Norlight's website, you will see that in their practices, besides making the aggr aggregate, which is, again, goes through that incinerator that's fueled by hazardous waste, they also take materials from the pollution control system. These are the bag house and the cyclone, and that's particulate matter, which is heavy metals and other materials like that. Um, when they were burning PFAS, since that is heat resistant, there may very well have been particles from that as well. And they mix that in with their aggregate and they call it, uh, they sell it as a separate product. Uh, I think it's called, um, uh, it's a mix. Um, uh, and, and, and they sell that as a separate product. That material that they're mixing in there is hazardous waste. And the only reason that they are allowed to mix that is because of an amendment in the law called the Bevel Amendment. So you guys should take a look at that, do some research on that as well. Um, but I look forward to Monday when I can release this documentary and uh, maybe we can talk more about it then. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Any questions from reporters? I know there was a lot of information press conference, but um, all of this information is in the press release, which I just put in the chat.
Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. No, we can't. Unmute. Well, I'm not sure if there are additional questions or technical issues. Uh, would, would I be able to make a statement? Mark Pascal, Chairman of the Housing Authority. Chairman of the Coho's Housing Authority, right? Yes, that's true. Hi, Mark. Hi, we've spoke. Uh, ju just to reiterate, I've, I've, um, I've said this before and just want, want to, uh, again, give the uh, position of the Coast Housing Authority. And that is that we, we need to close, we need to shut that down. We need to dispose of the Saratoga sites that no one, no one should have to live there under these circumstances. Obviously, the problem is not restricted to Saratoga sites but our, our intent and what we've been working on is, a, is a, um, an application to HUD to dispose, uh, to dispose of, of, that pub, of that public housing. Uh, we, I also wanna thank Joe Ritchie for, for all he's done uh, in support of this cause. And again, I, I recognize it's not, just, it's not just a Saratoga sites problem. I personally live about a half mile away from, uh, from Norlite and it, it's, uh, it, it's it's a it's an outrage that this has been allowed to continue, and I can't ask enough. Where is DEC in, in all this? Some of it's technical, some of it's complicated, some of it's not, and it just seems to be allowed to continue. But again, we're we're in the process of of trying to uh, to dispose of that as public housing. Of course, that will involve uh, helping the residents with other other uh, accommodations on on where they can move to, but that that is our position that, that no one should no one should be living next to Norlite. Hello. Hi, Rick. Hi, how you doing? Hey, quick question: Has anyone looked at? Is there any sense that there's a higher incidence of silicosis in in the city of Cohoes or, or or nearby there? Has anyone looked done done an epidemiological study of that or? Or should that be done? Who would be best to answer that, Chris? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. The the, the truth is that um, there's a, a very a very challenging um, epidemiological study um, to conduct. Uh, small population, um, a lot of other confounding factors. Uh, when the CDC came in about 15 years ago or so, they had inconclusive results. Um, but I, I, I think that I feel like it, it should be monitored um, continuously, but just the actual fact of, um, you know, material that causes the silicosis, uh, unambiguous, you know, uh, proof of, of material that, that causes silicosis, unambiguous proof that it comes from Norway should be enough uh, to suggest that uh, silicosis and pulmonary fibrosis are, are probably occurring. And I happen to know a woman who died a year and a half ago lives about 800 feet from those piles. Um, she died of pulmonary fibrosis, um, which is silicosis. Um, impossible to prove, you know, with the one case, but this woman had no uh, occupational, um, you know, exposure, no, no other risk factors, lived for 40 years, uh, 800 feet from Norlite's piles and uh, had to endure you know, dust storms had family picnics uh, for all that time and passed away quite suddenly from a classical case of pulmonary fibrosis, silicosis, a year and a half ago. So I'm not going to name who that is. The, the family's not entirely comfortable um, with, uh, with that, but anecdotally that, that that should be brought up. Um, so sorry, Rick, I don't think that there's really a conclusive um, epidemiological study uh, to point to uh, the incidence or increased incidence of, um, of disease in the area. Uh, but those studies can be quite challenging, uh, especially with the, the small numbers of, of, uh, of people and the, the transient nature of, um, you know, a lot of people's um, uh, sort of living arrangements in the area. So with, with renters coming in and out. Um, but, uh, you know, any, any follow-up questions on that? I, no, I think that's okay. Thanks. Sure. If I could just say one thing quickly, and I think we, we lose sight of this. Um, we're talking all the time about 
you know, parts per million, parts per billion, 0.2 this, 0.3 that. What does this mean? What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you this. There's a human side to this problem. The human side is, is that tens of thousands of people are living in the direct area of Norlite and their emotions, their feelings about this are being ignored. We're focused on these tests. We're focused on these results that are supposed to be coming out. People know what's happening to them. They know what's in their house. They don't need a test to show that. They don't need a test to show that they're suffering. They're suffering. There's issues that need to be resolved. They need to be solved ASAP because for far too long, the people of the immediate area have been ignored. Plain and simple. And this is a classic, in my opinion, this is a classic example of environmental discrimination. It needs to stop and the people's voice, feelings and emotions need to be heard. Because we have people going on to DEC's um, conferences that they have crying because they're, they're so concerned about their children's health, their children's, why are their children are developing asthma when they've never smoked, they've never done anything, but when they move here, because they have nowhere else to go, their children develop these awful diseases. There needs to be answers, but the people's feelings, the emotions, and the humanization of this issue needs to be in the forefront because the people need to direct the narrative, not the DEC and not with these tests. People are suffering and they need the answers. Any further questions? there are no further questions, then I suppose that that wraps up our news conference today. Thank you everybody for coming. If you have any follow-up questions, please contact me or Joe. Our information is in the press release. Um, if you'd like to interview any of the panelists, we can get you in touch with them as well. So thank you all for coming today. <laughs>